Hello and welcome to Motor Week and to the second of two programmes looking at the highlights of this, the British International Motor Show 2000 at the Birmingham NEC. is from Jensen. It's based on the SV8 Roadster platform. Customers will be taking delivery of the first ones of those in January 2001. And then there's a whole range to choose from, because there's this as well, which will be arriving with first customers in January 2002. Now, just because they're only going to be churning them out in fairly small numbers, probably about 600, doesn't make it any the easier to sell a car that is still £45,000. That's a lot of money, even to the truly wedged up. So it needs certain crucial elements. Amongst them, it's got to look good. And this, well, it does. It's a really traditional Grand Tour shape. There are shades of, yes, sure, some of the original older Jensen's, the Interceptor and the like, but even odd angles will give you odd ideas, like a bit of MGB GT somehow, even some of the old Porsche 944 or 68 about the, the cockpit and the window shape. All in all, it adds up to quite a, a taut, controlled and not that flamboyant design for what is essentially a show car, even though it's very close to what will definitely be built next year. You also need to have a good badge. Well, it has. Jensen, at least it's a recognisable name, so small volume, but still a name with a heritage. It makes you feel a bit more secure when you part with your wedge. And the other thing you need is reliability. This has the engine from a Mustang, all Ford sourced, right the way back through the gearbox to the axle at the back all still warranted by Ford, so with a bit of luck you can buy a small, exclusive car and it'll still work every time. We wish them all the best. R8 is a race car designed solely for the purpose of winning Le Mans. It's powered by a 3.6 litre V8 with twin turbos that puts out 610 brake horsepower. And firing through that F1 style gear change, this car will reach speeds of up to 230 miles per hour. Mm. The Audi R8 has been tremendously successful on the racetrack, winning Le Mans this year as well as taking second and third places. And despite requests, Audi say they have no plans to make a road-going production version. Oh, what a shame. The 147 is the latest and the most important car to join the Alfa Romeo stable, and we got to drive it. One four seven. If you're a snooker player, then it's the ultimate, the holy grail, because it's the highest possible break that you can achieve. And it's also the number Alfa Romeo have given to their newest hatchback. So to measure up to its new name or new number, the 147, had better be pretty darn good. Let's assume that even the worst of today's car isn't exactly a complete duffer, so all the reds have been potted. It's time now to get to grips with the coloured balls. First up then, the yellow ball for just two points. Well, I suppose in any Alfa Romeo, practicality isn't exactly up there as top priority. It's certainly not the black, so let's take that as the yellow ball. How does it fare? Well, it's a hatchback. It's got a reasonable size boot and four seats. So let's assume the yellow potted. No problem. Green. Is it green next? Yeah. Green. Let's call that build quality. Never exactly brilliant in old Alfa Romeos, but all that of course changed with the 156 and before. And that seems to have continued in this. In fact, it feels pretty high quality. The interior certainly doesn't contain any nasty, tacky, cheap feeling plastics. So that's the green. No problem. And so it's on to the brown. Let's call that comfort. Never exactly top of the list of priorities in Italian cars, but it's not bad. Fairly typical Italian driving position, short on legs, long on arms, but certainly not uncomfortable. So that's the brown. 
so nervously, the pressure's really on, he lines up for the blue. Will it go down or will it bounce off the cushion? Well, let's take blue as the price. Now, I can't give you the actual price yet for the 147 because Alfa Romeo haven't told us yet. But let's assume that given pricing is such a sensitive issue in the UK, Alfa Romeo aren't going to go completely mad and overprice the 147. And also, as the current one is only, what, £12,500 it starts from, it's not massively expensive anyway. So we'll have to take it as red, if you see what I mean, that the blue goes down. <laughs> My, but the pressure really is on as we reach the pink. Style, so how does it fare? I really like it. It's certainly nothing of the boxy look of the predecessor. It's got the very much modern Alfa Romeo look with these rather small features, a sort of pinched look. It's perhaps more 166 than 156, whereas the 156 is kind of smooth. The 166 has that sculpted look, and this has the same with this big scallop side cut out. I think it looks great. So, a great big hush descends upon the crowd, and not a buttock is left unclenched as he approaches the table for the black, the big one, performance. This is, after all, an Alfa Romeo, so how does it measure up when it comes to the driving experience? Well, there's a choice of engines. Two 1.6s, one with 105, one with 120 brake horsepower, there or thereabouts, a 2.0-litre with about 150 brake horsepower, and a JTD, a turbo diesel common rail. Well, that'll be a stormer, I'm sure. This, though, is the 1.6 with 120 brake horsepower, and it ain't a firecracker. It shows a marked reluctance to rev past about 5,000 revs, which is a bit of a disappointment. And the gearbox, too, is a bit sulky. It's very difficult to go from first to second quickly, which is just what you want to do. That said, once you've got the whole package rolling, it's excellent. It handles really nicely, very predictable. Start to abuse it a little bit around the corners and it'll let you know when it's going to let go and do so progressively and gently so you can put the odd little slide in and feel reasonably safe. So performance, I'd say it does it. The black sinks. <laughs> But now, hold on a second. Quick reality check here. 147. What you're talking about here is perfection. And that's a lot to ask of any car, so perhaps that's a little ambitious. But maybe it gets close, because what you do get is a practical little hatchback that offers something else. It makes you feel a bit special. You're not driving something run-of-the-mill, which is very nice. Ford's slick advertising might bill it as the backbone of Britain, but that doesn't stop it being a pain in the bum bone if you're stuck behind one on a narrow road. But that's not entirely fair, because obviously if it wasn't for the transit and fans like it, then lots of really important and useful stuff wouldn't get to lots of, well, really important places. So the transit does matter a lot to you and to me. Yeah, I know, it's a van, but it's such a familiar sight on the country's roads that it really is worth spending just a couple of seconds looking at the new transit. And let's be honest, the boys and girls who spend their time out in these things, delivering stuff from one place to another, spend a lot of time in them, so they've got to be comfortable. Ah, and in here they will be. Now, we had a transit when I was in a band back in, ooh, goodness knows when, by younger days. And that one stank of feet and beer. And it didn't have electric windows and electric mirrors in a nice, comfy driving position and a nice car-like dash. But this has. Vans are a very different place to be now, which is nice if you have to spend a lot of your time there. Ah, oh, Fiat. Wonderful Italian styling. Well, our Richard Hammond took time out to say a fond farewell to the Fiat Coupe.
this is it then, old friend. Goodbye, the end for the Fiat Coupe. And as it sits here, it's life flashing before its headlamps. It's odd to think it's only, what, six years ago in 94 when it first hit the scene and made quite a stir. Particularly when you think of its siblings at the time in the Fiat range, they were a rather ropey bunch. We had what? The Uno, the Tipo, the Panda, the Tempra. But it wasn't just the Fiat range that the Coupe stood out from. It was everything. Even now, it's a striking design. Back then, we'd seen nothing like it. The dynamic body shape alone was enough to make it stand out, but it was the extra little touches that made it every inch the mini Ferrari. Underneath all of this glamour and glitz, there actually lies, wait for it, a Fiat Tipo platform. Mmm, thank you very much. Actually, it has been massively stiffened, of course, by the addition of a coupe body shell. That said, you can still feel it twisting, particularly when you've got the kind of power going through it that this car's got. Mind you, you can forgive it a lot of that just for having this shiny body-coloured panel on the dashboard. Probably again due to that chassis, the steering certainly isn't the most precise of operations and it gets a little bit woolly on bends and we do find we're lacking grip. But that's compensated for because when you pull in to fill up with petrol, you've got that gorgeous filler cap to deal with. You'll feel like you're in a Le Mans race. Even though it is an older design that's on its way out, basically it'll still turn heads and attract attention. But I'm not sure if that isn't just due to the individual design touches, which are gorgeous. But overall, well, you could say the design of the car isn't actually perfectly proportioned. But we're back to those lovely touches. We can forgive it. On paper, at least, the performance figures for this, the ultimate 20-valve turbo coupe, put it pretty much in the supercar league. 0 to 60 in about six seconds, top speed of over 150 miles an hour. But 220 brake horsepower through the front wheels can make for a bit of a scrabble if you take off in a hurry. The slightest ripple in the road and that's it. You're heading off in that direction. Mind you, it is a lot of power and you do feel you are in something pretty rapid and it can get pretty exciting in here. So, the Fiat Coupe is soon to be finished. No more. An ex-coupe. How sad. Still, whenever it gets to wherever old coupes go after this life, it'll be amongst some pretty illustrious company, including glorious old stages like the VW Corrado, quite possibly one of the best front-wheel-driven coupes ever made, and the Vauxhall Calibra. Love it or loathe it, it was certainly striking. Still, at least you and I will be left with cars like, ooh, the Astra Coupe and the Citroen Zara Coupe. Mmm. Well, the Beetle, yes, is still one of my firm favourites. And if you want to see plenty more surprises, join us again after the break here at the Birmingham Motor Show. They use Mizuro is a concept car packed full with all the gadgets you'd normally find in the cockpit of a modern military vehicle. The colour of the Mizuro adds to the feeling of sophistication and looks like a very futuristic car indeed. I get the feeling that they've pinched the sports roof idea from the SLK, but it certainly works. The interval between new TVRs used to be something measured in decades, but now they're coming thick and fast. In fact, a motor show wouldn't be a motor show without a new TVR somewhere. And actually, compared to previous cars we've seen in other years, this, the Tamara, is really, well, not that Looney Tunes. Think of the first time we saw the Tuscan. They reckon that this, the Tamara, will eventually be the replacement for the Griffith, which incredibly is, what, nearly a decade old now. And for TVR, it's quite a conservative sort of car. Well, as conservative and sensible as you can be with a straight-six engine up front, pushing out 330 brake horsepower through the rear wheels. As with the Tuscan TVR are promising that this, although a seriously hairy car, will offer a degree of practicality. And from the looks of it, I'd say it will. Now all the manufacturers seem to be jumping onto the bandwagon and this is Daihatsu's attempt at the mini MPV market.
by the proven Yaris engine, the YRV will comfortably seat five people and their belongings. It's hugely economical, very practical and not bad looking for a purely functional car. It goes on sale next spring and will be priced at around £11,000. So, Anthony, ah, you've had a look around. Indeed. Um, what kind of show is it? Quiet. Very quiet indeed. Well, in terms of people or cars? In terms of cars, I don't think I've seen anything here today that wasn't in Paris. So it's not exactly uh, lighting your trousers up at the moment? No wind under the frock, I'm afraid. You've had a look around there. There must be some highlights. I mean, there's, some, there's the Porsche Carrera GT, which That's is That's a very pretty car, isn't it? Alpha 147, very nice. Walter de Silva's last piece of work before running off to Seat. So it would be nice to see something from Seat soon, I hope. Is there any kind of theme to the new cars? Because some years there's like a big rash of British sports cars or hot hatches or is there, a, there's no kind of theme of new car that's coming along? The only thing that I've noticed is that most of them seem to have taken a damn good thrashing with the ugly stick. Uh, the Citroen C5 deserves special mention in that respect. I don't know if you've seen it. It's this thing about a sort of cheesy grin grill and the big head headlamps. Ever since that somebody described the the lights on a Scorpio is um, headlights being the new jewellery for cars. Everybody's jumped on board the bandwagon. The Japanese have all started doing it and now everybody's following suit. Well, there's nothing new, of course. And people do come to shows primarily, I think, in the hope of seeing something new. We haven't talked about the Mondeo. Should we talk about the Mondeo? With its German interior. And they haven't quite been able to shrug off the overall obsession, that nasty little silver shiny clock in the middle. What a shame that is. Despite all the bitching and all the talking about what goes on behind the scenes. Is the motor show still worth a look? Is it still what it was in the old days? I think, I th I think if you're anything of a car nut, it's always worth a look. I was just surprised at how few genuinely new models there are. The VW Passat. Now, the old model made the move from being a rather humdrum car to, well, a rather humdrum car with a very nice standard of finish. This new version launched only now promises just a little bit more. The same standard of finish, but perhaps a little more exciting and practical. To find out, we went on the launch. Volkswagen have been ringing the changes, 2,300 changes in fact, to make their newly revised Passat. Now, I always thought of the old Passat as very much a whole meal kind of car. The kind where you could be sure that the owners recycled and wore woolly pullies and probably had their kiddies' paintings pinned on their fridge and their kitchen walls. Then, four years or so ago with the new Passat, it all became a little more refined. And now for this version, well, 2,300 changes. 2,300, eh? That's quite a list. Number one, the grille. Yep, it's uh, deeper shinier. Number two, headlamps uh -huh. by Xenon. Very nice, very bright. Number three, the bumper. Yep, that's changed. Number four. Oh, don't I go on? Where's the fast forward button? In actual fact, the Passat has always been an enjoyable car to drive, perhaps not the most exciting, but certainly very competent and capable, and this latest incarnation continues that trend. By preference, I'd say go for the diesel, any of the diesels. That's always been the case for the last couple of generations of Passat. The engine is strong and powerful with loads of mid-range torque and punch, making it very easy to drive surprisingly quickly. Item number 52. Engines. Well, you've got a choice of eight in total, of which three are new. There are four diesel and three petrol. The new ones are two 1.9-litre TDI diesel engines, one with 101 and one with 130 brake horsepower, and a 170 brake horsepower V5 petrol engine. Mm, lovely. This is the 1.9-litre with 130 brake horsepower, by the way, one of the turbo diesel injection engines. Very nice it is too. Loads of mid-range, all the punch you'd expect from a good modern diesel. That allied to plenty of power and not bad economy either. Now, item number, where are we? 53. Oh, God, am I really going to go through the entire list? Yeah. Come on. Oh, this could take forever. Get a move on. Just where is a Macanaca valve, anyway? Wow, just think how much fun this guy is at parties. 
Unlike some VWs, namely the Beetle, the Passat has never sold in millions worldwide. But VWs say they're not too displeased about that, particularly in the UK. Smaller numbers mean the car doesn't become the ubiquitous rep mobile, bland, boring and with dreadful residuals. It keeps its value. Buy one new, you won't lose a packet when you come to sell it second hand. Right then, number 745. The centre console. Yep, that's new, very nice, very clear, nothing too major. No other major changes to the dash though. I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Next, uh, this crease down the bonnet has been increased. Very nice, very striking. Right, number 725. Hammond, you're boring me beyond the point of death. Speed up. Mmm, how the long winter evenings must simply fly by in a Hammond household. Come on, you boring little twerp. There's about a thousand still to go. It's worth noting that VW are promising to keep their prices more or less the same as they are for the present Passat range, which means particularly the turbo diesels, which have always represented excellent value, should continue to be just that. So then, where's my list? Number 1274. Important change this. The boot. It's a newly revised boot opening which gives us much better access. Nice, number 1,275, uh, rear light clusters. Yes, they're different, definitely. Number 1,276, that's new options pack, and that includes, rather niftily, a solar sunroof, which will actually run an electric fan to cool the car on a hot day. Now, come on, people will be switching off, making tea, losing interest. Say something interesting. Oh, I think I'm gonna cry, just get a move on, no more lists. 2,230 is a new chrome strip around the windows. And that is it. 2,230 changes so much for your list. I shall not ask what's changed next time. I'm just going to drive it around a bit and see if I like it. And that's it from the British International Motor Show 2000. I hope some of the highlights that we've picked out have appealed to you. It's back to normal next week on Motor Week, so join us. We'll be taking a look at some of the best and brightest that the industry has to offer.